Welcome back to another episode of the ATO Podcast. Today we're talking to Mark Hart of SystemBasketball.com. We're talking with Coach Hart about the system style of play and all its variations and get into dribble drive motion. We finished up talking player development and practice planning for any style of play. No matter what you're running, there's something for everyone in this episode of the After the Timeout Podcast. All right, Coach, we're going to start with the opening tip segment. It's just a way for our guests uh, and us to kind of get comfortable. So we wanted to start with your passion for, obviously, system basketball. Uh, I'm sure as many of our listeners know, um, you know, you're big into the system and hold your own podcast and YouTube talk. So kind of take us through your first time you learned about the system. You know, over time, what made you so interested in it and why did you want to spread the passion for it? I learned, I started studying it in, what was it, uh, 2010, 2011. Um, I was running dribble drive motion offense, which I still run today, but um, wanted to play faster. So um, growing up in California, I knew about uh, University of Redlands and Gary Smith, who who ran it and would watch him play at the University of Laverne. I grew up in the city of Laverne and the college there um, plays against Redlands during the same conference. So I would always attend those games and scores were 120 to 111 and it, the gym was packed. There's lots of excitement. So um, I, I contacted Gary and we started talking and started studying in it and to be honest, I've never fully ran it full fledged the way it's designed to be ran because I'm too chicken to give up the layups that you might see on on it. And but I've taken aspects of it and use use aspects of it, but I've never done the full on five in five out subbing hockey subs, forty five second subs. Um, haven't gone got to that crazy. I mean, I've studied it now for eleven years. Uh, COVID hit and. I was going to run it with my team, didn't have the numbers, so I started doing the, the calls with some of the top coaches, and it just be, it, it just grew from there, and it's a fun and exciting way to play basketball. Um, there's so many different versions of it, or hybrids, if you will, of, of various people that run it. That's kind of the love affair of it. So let's get into a little bit more detail on it then. Um you know, everybody, I think people, coaches look at it and like, oh, yeah, the system, that looks great. I, I think where it kind of falls short sometimes is uh, in installing it, right? Putting it in right. and do, doing the, the right thing. So, you know, you, you said you haven't gone full in, but it says a coach wants to go full system, right? Wants to, wants to install it. Um, how do you go about starting to install it? Hey, you got to really – you got to go and, and study it. I mean, Gary Smith, Doug Porter are big, um, big help guys for me. I've gotten to know both of them personally really well. They, they have the book coaching the system. Um, I bought that book and that's where kind of also started. Uh, it's not just great for the system, but installing it, you gotta, you gotta study it, understand it. If you're just trying to do it for wins, I, I probably would not do it just to win basketball games. It was designed to get participation and a lot of other factors from, from Dave Arsenal, the originator of it. Um, but there's various versions. So when you're saying installing, are you referring to the Grinnell style or are you referring to Loyola Marymount style? Which, which system are you guys either, or which one are you guys more interested well, in? Uh, so let's go, let's go with the, the pace aspect of it. Right. Cause I think that's okay. probably common. Okay when anybody puts it in, whether it's a hybrid or not, um, you know, I know everybody talks about wanting to play at pace, but then mm -hmm. actually playing at pace is a different thing. So let's just talk about the, the, the pace of play in the, in the system style. Um, as far as installing it, um, I'd go back to the Paul Westhead days of, of, I think everybody's heard of a cycle drill where you're just teaching your transition break. Um, you might want to do it in a, in a one way, cycle where you're just doing a lot of reps getting them used to getting out wide um whether you're running loyola's break uh grinnell's break the fancy um two-sided 
transition break. The offensive component, a part of installing in the break, isn't really the thing. It's like you said, the pace. You can choose whatever the Grinnell break, uh, University Pacific runs a ball screen system, Gr Greenville runs a five out. That's what's unique about it. The, the, the aspect of the system is not just geared towards one style of play. You can run whatever offense you want. That the common denominator usually is the press. And the press usually is an on-ball, uh, inside-out, where you're denying inside-out, forcing them to corners, and you're kind of matched up. As soon as the ball goes in, you get two players on the ball. You deny the reversal pass, so you have two interceptors and a protector. That That's the key is not necessarily the break. The break's important, but it's the defense going from the backcourt, full court, to the half court where you continue trapping and trapping and then the subbing aspect that's that's what that's what gets the that's what gets the pace cuz if you ever lined up your players on the line and did line drills and you did the free throw line touch um, also known as suicide drills that we don't really allow to say that say that name anymore on drills but um, they they could probably do that two times in a row third time if you tell them uh, 32 seconds or whatever it is, third time they're probably not going to be able to do it. So if you do that type of stuff, they're going to understand if they're playing that fast, they're going to need a break to go back in and do it. The pace is dictated by the defense. Crashing the boards. So you send four players to the boards. And then you're right in and your pressing makes and misses. So the install of it, real quick again for you is, I would teach, you got to teach the... Most people would say you teach the break for about a week, three to four days, and then you're going to teach the defense. Um, Dave Arsenal told us is you teach the break on a maid because unfortunately the other team's going to be scoring a lot. <laughs> so uh, you get, there's there's he said there is, and I agree with him. You can get the ball back by a maid shot. You can get it back by them turning the ball over to you, stealing it. You can get it back in a dead ball situation to travel, or you can get the ball back on a defensive rebound. So you got to practice four ways how you're going to play out of those situations. And the way he would break that down is maybe day one, you do the made. Day two, you would do miss. And now you start working on referee handles, which you don't maybe put in one, one or two quick hitters there. So the referee blows his whistle. You got to be playing against a defense that is already set and then maybe re rehearse it the best you can because I don't think you want to practice your players turning the ball over so you got to come up with something unique to practice them getting it and then getting into their spots so there's like four components to the offense of that hope that hope that helps and answers it yeah so I, to build off of that I, I'm really interested in for you personally, what are some important statistics you use to measure your team's success at running it? We'll get into a little bit more of, of things to look for in the high school game. But, you know, for you, what are some of those statistics you use to know, hey, this is being successful right now? For me, it's a little bit different than the traditional system coach. It's free throw attempts because um, I want to be attacking the basket typically when – my teams would get 24 free throw attempts or more. Uh, we would win around like 85% of our games. So that was a key one. And number two would be offensive rebounding percentage. Um, because we want to get more shots than our opponents. And we also want to get points in the paint. I think, I think my personal ones are the team that scores the most points in the paint usually win in high school basketball. And... If you're attacking the basket, you're going to get points in the pink, and you're probably going to get fouled. So offensive rebounds and free throws would be my two most important things that I look at. And that's interesting that you go into the offensive rebounds because I know we had George Barber on from Greenville, and he was really big into the offensive rebound element of it. For you in a high school game, typical high school game, um, you know, what are you looking for possession-wise? Are you looking for – you know, 80, 90 possessions in a game for your team? Are you looking for, you know, what are you looking for possession-wise? 
before I even knew what the system was, I had my own little formula and it was 75 shot attempts and it wasn't quite system issue where I think you guys know half usually is the percentage. Mine was 50, 50 shots in the paint. Okay. And then 25 three point attempts and then the 24 free throw attempts. So I guess in my terms, it was seven, it was 75, I, 75 shots. I don't, I, I didn't. I never said, "Hey, this many possessions." It was shot attempts, free throw attempts, is what it was. And to take it a step further, it was it was minuscule the amount of shooting percentage that we wanted. We wanted to make twenty out of fifty points in the paint. 20, 20 out of fifty shots in the paint. It's only forty percent shooting, and but that gets you forty points. If we went I wanted to go eight for twenty-five on the free throw on the three-point line, so that's thirty-three percent. So that's another twenty-four points. So twenty and twenty-four is forty-four. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, twenty forty-four, and then sixteen, sixteen for twenty, sixteen for twenty-four on the foul line. So we wanted to go around seventy percent ish as a team. So, um, twenty out of fifty. I think my math's off. Four, that was 64 points. And then 60. So 80 points. Yep. 80 points on a night you shot 37%. Yep. Very good. Like 37%, it. I think, is doable for a high school team. The hard part is getting those possessions. So how do you do it? You have to press on makes and misses. So that's the only way I see you getting that many possessions. It helps here in California because I have a 35 second shot clock, too. Um, no doubt. Elsewhere, yeah. we would love so, for that in Illinois. Yeah, it's coming. We're we're getting it here in Illinois, but um, yeah. We, all right, I, so I switched. I switched to girls, so now here it's thirty seconds. It's 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 a weird phenomenon. Real quick with that thirty seconds, but we don't have a ten second violation. Girl can stand on the backcourt the whole time. Which so we are I pressed. guess I guess it, if somebody's good, he gets the press. It makes it a little bit more difficult to press, right? Well, our first game was last last Tuesday and about the third possession of the game, me coaching boys for 25 years. I knew the rule, but I was still you're, you're hollering for a 10. I look up at the shot clock. It's 11 seconds before they cross mid court. So it took them 19 seconds to get the ball across mid court. I'm like, ah, that's a turnover. Come on. Like, and they ended up, it broke down because we were, we were expending so much energy in the back court. They ended up getting a layup. So I just kind of threw my hand and said, Good job, girls. That's 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 fine. <laughs> like, yeah. What are you What are you gonna do at that point? So you mentioned complimenting you know, your defense, complimenting your offense in the full court. Let's back it up into half court, right? Because there's there's gonna be, especially early in the season, right? Games tend to be sloppy. There's a lot of stoppages, um, whatever it may be. Um, how do you complement that style of play in in, in the half court and can you be, can you play a zone if, if you want to, uh, you know, maybe that's best for your team. Can you yeah, incorporate you, a zone into that, yeah, the, the system type of play? Yeah, you can. Um, Paul Westhead did it. Um, Loyola Marymount. I mean, I mean, going back, love affair probably started then being a California boy. Um, the Loyola Marymount team with Hank Gathers and, uh, Bo Kimball, um, he would do it because he only played his version with seven or eight guys. Um, and they played the whole game and they pressed, they pressed on make miss, but they would fall back into a half court zone and not press where Greenville, you mentioned George Barber, he'll continue to, he'll continue to trap. So it, it all depends on how deep you are. Are you, are you playing five in five out? If you are, then you probably could trap and keep the keep the tempo up. If you're only playing eight nine, when you're only playing eight nine, I think it makes it hard to press on misses too. It it all depends on how deep you want to go, and I think that's part of the coaching issues when coaches look at running this is they don't feel that they're deep enough, or they don't want to play more than what they have. So they revolt back to kind of playing more traditional and being quote unquote 
not a system team, but they're an up tempo team. And they're and they're playing fast, but they're not running the system. So I want to now dig into kind of the half court. So you you get it up, you, you're not you know you don't score in the the first few seconds of the clock. Um, you know I like you, I I do have some dribble drive principles in my offense. So let's kind of go into the dribble drive now. Um, okay. You know for you, let's just start off. Let's say a, a high school coach. It's their first year, brand new, taking over their team, and they want to start with dribble drives. What would you say to that coach that are two or three things that they should do to start to install the dribble drive? First thing I mentioned to them is how much control have they had in their program before? Because sure. if you're a set play guy or you have to dictate who shoots the ball or you want to know where the shot's going to come from, it might not be for you. Uh, you got to kind of sit back and it's more of a system that you let your players make plays. Um, I was a flex guy and it took me a while to adjust to that. Um, but installing it, I, I would, I would, I, you want to know how, how to install it or, or just what I would tell them starting off. I, I would let's start off with what would you just tell them? Give me two or three things to just start off. What would you say? So I agree with you. One of them is they're going to have to give up some control before we go to the install. What's maybe one or two other things that you would say? Um, I would work. I mean, definitely you got to have a little, you got to work on shooting and ball handling and attacking. So I would, would, talk to them about hey how much how much are you how much have you been working on putting the ball on the floor playing play more one on one i i would tell them if you haven't been playing one on one play two on two play three on three play things that are focusing on getting the ball to the basket and if they can't get to the basket passing the ball out and then playing off the catch um it's not a he's in LA now um it's not a Carmelo Anthony pivot 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 offense so you got to play off the catch so just focusing on it's it's a totally different it's a mindset i don't even want to call it an offense to be quite honest it's a it's a mindset it's attack offense you're playing off concepts it's not a, when i hear the word offense i think you have set and stringent rules there are rules but um i mean that that question's that question's tough to be to, because I get asked it, but it's hard to answer it because what do I? It all gets to. They ask, "What if I don't have this player? What if I don't have that?" It's it's not really a player. Player based decision, in my opinion, it's how do you want to play as a coach, and can you get your players to do it? The myth is you got to have Derrick Rose, you don't. <laughs> Well, so let me let me go into this a little deeper because I love the, the discussion you kind of started to have, but I want to go in just deeper as a follow-up. Why do you think so many coaches need that much control? You know, why are coaches so uncomfortable with just teaching players just decision making and allowing them more choice? How do if a if a coach wanted to you know, start to seed. Obviously, this is really easy to just say, give the players more power. But how how do you think a coach begins to change their mindset? Um, for me, well, for me, it maybe a, maybe what you're doing isn't working. You're looking for your board. <laughs> you're looking for, or you study the game of basketball and say, hey, you watch it on TV and you see people with freedom. They're using ball screens, the floor spaced. Um, giving up control part is hard for people because maybe they've never been in a, maybe they're a young coach and they played in a flex offense or played in a structured environment. They don't know anything else. Um, and much like players, your players probably want absolutes. Coaches want absolutes to an extent saying i want to make sure my best players are getting the most shots and i've ran it for 13 years 
and my best player has always gotten the most shots. That's just coaching, teaching slot, shot selection. That doesn't have anything to do with what's going to happen with the dribble drive. So, I mean, that's 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 my take on that a little bit. All right, then let's kind of go into, um, you know, in a general general offense for a high school team that runs the system, at whether you know you're talking about the the Arsenal version or the West Head version or whatever, how many shots on average should a player get up a week, you know, in practice? Obviously, there's a lot of shooting focus, you know, if you want to do this because you're going to shoot a lot. Um, you know, what are we looking for shots a week for a kid? I'm talking about three-pointers or just yeah, shots let's, in general? No, let's focus on threes. That was going to be my – let's focus okay. on threes. Well – what I learned from them is typically every day you start practice shooting a hundred. So if you're practicing, so minimum when you're in the gym, a hundred a day. Okay. And that usually takes, if you have two players in the gym or two players per one ball should take you 20 minutes to get five spots, 23s at each spot. If they're, if they're working, if they're socializing and taking a long time to shoot the ball, It'll take you 25, 27 minutes. And then for you, because I know the kind of the number for me in my own head, but for you, what's an acceptable, I hate to use the word acceptable, but what can you live with turnover wise in a game? How many turnovers can you live with? That's a tough, I mean, turnover number. I don't really like to go by that because that's right. dictated on possessions. Yep. So more of a percentage, if you will. Um, 12 to 15%. Okay. So I, I get what you're saying because I used to be that way when I ran a more structured offense, be like, oh, we need to be 15 or less, um, yep. 12 or less. Um, if you're playing 100 possessions, I guess that'd be more like 15 turnovers. Well, and, and I think even too, for me, it, it depends on the turnover. If it's a baseball pass that you throw over your teammate's head because you're trying to get a transition layup, okay, I'm going to live with that turnover more than I am you're trying to dribble back and forth and be fancy. So I think it also depends on the kind, but. I agree with that. Um, now I want to get into the decision-making aspect because no matter what you're doing, dribble drive, the system, mm -hmm. whatever, uh, decision-making is the key. Um, and I, 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 you know, feel like a lot of players have, have the skill, right? Whether it be shooting skill, ball handling skill, but the difference then comes into their uh, decision-making. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like you said, you mentioned, okay, well, we're going to, you know, look to shoot it, but then, okay, when, do, when am I ripping? When am I attacking the basket? When am I moving it? What are some things you like to do to teach that decision-making? Um, you know, cause I think, I, I think it's a hard uh, concept, especially as, as player, maybe younger players are coming up is, that decision making and, and helping them see what that decision is. What are some things you do to help your teams with the decision making aspect of it? We play a lot of small sided games where we give the offense a little bit of an advantage over the defense. So it puts them, so it makes the defense kind of help, if you will. So they got to be able to, as they're driving the basket, are they helping? Or are they fake helping? Do I make a layup or did they help? Now I got to stop, find who the correct player to pass to is. So we run a lot of three on three, four on four, two on two drills that handicap the defense either out of the full court or the half court setting. So that's how I would get them playing, playing, but you structure the drills so that they're playing and they have to make the, make the decision. So let's get, let's get finishing then. Let's talk about finishing, right? Okay. Uh, you talked about the help. Well, mm -hmm. When you, you got a player who's driving, tacking the basket, um, what are some of the keys you're telling them to kind of look for to know, oh, okay, or, or feel, right? Maybe the player's on your hip, whatever. Yeah, I can get that layup or I got, I got to kick that. I got to kick that shot out. Okay, as far as when we're driving and we're going to go in for a, for a finish, if they're on my hip, we're playing off two feet. 
if they're behind me, we're probably playing off one leg and getting it to the front of the rim. And that could be a right hand or inside hand layup. Um, far as if we pass, pretty much the the read is if I see sternum, I'm stopping. And I'm probably kicking. If I see arm, I'm playing through the arm. Okay. And finishing. And it's not just on the player itself. It's the other four players moving in relationship to the ball, calling right. out where they are on the floor. So if they see a help to helper situation, so a natural situation is a slot drive straight down the lane and the post comes over. So the opposite corner helps the helper. So that corner player needs to elevate into a, like a 45 degree angle. I call it a window. So as soon as that player helped, they're elevating, but as they're elevating, they're yelling window to their teammate, letting them know that they helped the helper. So that's, I'm open. Because you guys have probably been in the situation. If you drive to the basket, if you sit there and watch players play, where are they going to throw the ball? To the player in the right corner or the post player? Because those are the only, those are the two people in their vision. They're not going to see the person behind their head. And they're not going to see the person in their 45. But I'm going to tell you, they're more likely going to throw the ball to the player in the corner. So we've almost put into it a rule in, once they get about mid-paint, they're either racking it, dumping it to the post, throwing it opposite floor, or reverse pivoting and throwing behind them. Same corner doesn't exist anymore. Because that little loopy pass, one player can basically guard two. If that if that makes sense. Oh yeah, and it doesn't really it doesn't really get the defense moving any. You're still on the and same that, side of the floor. And it bogs and your defense. And you have and that, your drive. You have your driver sitting in the lane. So even if that person wanted to redrive, there's yeah. four people there because the tendency is to pause for a second and not get out. At least, at least I, my experience yeah. on that. I rather them pick the ball up way up the floor at the free throw line area or the three point line area and give that corner player the opportunity to cut back door or come up to the ball. Let's it go puts, into shot. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, That's I was going to go into shot selection now because you mentioned shot selection because that's another key opponent. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a lot of good AE teams out there, but at, at times, you know, I've seen kids come in the summer from AE games and like, you know, they're, they're getting up shots. So how, how are you looking to kind of teach your players? Okay. This is a good shot. What is the criteria of, of a, a, a quality shot? Uh, and obviously it depends on, on player, right. But Correct. just in general, <laughs> just in general, okay with this is within your skill set what is what are some of the basic things you're saying that's a good shot typically we want to paint touch before we shoot a three unless it's a player on our team that shoots 40 percent or higher from three he could shoot it no matter whenever he wants if if you have a player i'm sure it's the same for you guys yeah. um we want to paint touch kick out threes and uh, rhythm i call them th rhythm threes so Pretty much they're uncontested. Catch and shoot rhythm threes. We want rim layups if we can or paint pulls. Uh, paint pull is a mid-range in the paint. Um, I'm not anti-anti mid-range, but I do not like uh, mid-range outside the key. Because um, our emphasis on offense is in this order, free key or three. So we want to get to the foul line. Because that's the highest analytical shot that we can get as a team. At If we made 70% as a team and we shoot two free throws, we're going to get 1.4 points per possession. If we get in the paint, a rim shot, we want to shoot 50% or higher. So rim for us would be if you took an imaginary, if you had it in high school, the halo of the NBA with the charge circle, we want to get to the rim. Anything above that, to me is called a paint pool, a floater area, mid-range. We're okay with, but we want to look at our shot chart at the end of the games and see how many rim shots we have, how many three-pointers we have, how many free throw attempts we have, and then look at that other twos. And we played the other night, and we were... I tell the players all the time, you're going to shoot 28% 
from five feet to 19 to the, to the three point line. The girls team the other night, we were 20, 28% from those shots and we were six for 16 or six for 26 on threes. So we basically shot the same percentage from three as we did those shots. So they're starting to understand what we've been telling them. Why shoot that shot? If you can make the three, if you can get it, get three points instead of two and shoot the same percentage. So it, it's, it's selling it. It's, it's teaching analytics and, and analytics are talked about every day. I mean, Houston Rockets were running this, been running this stuff for a while. Um, Golden State Warriors, um, and the mid-range shot, most people will tell you, is not a high percentage shot. So we want rim. We want rim with with one-on-one -on -one coverage if we can. If, if a second player comes over, we would assume that our decision-making takes over and we're able to kick out to the open three-point shooter. Uh, so let's go opponents now. Um, and, and let's talk more dribble, dribble drive here. Um, and I guess we can talk a little bit of system. But what is giving... When you're running dribble drive, um, what is giving you the most trouble? What what do opponents do that gives it the most trouble? Defensively, I I'm different. When I get asked this question, um, I don't think it's so much what the defense does. I think it's I think it is skill development um, based upon what you can do, what you can't do. Um, Obviously, switching, switching no middle. Probably, if you, if you wanted a, wanted one, where they're a hard switching and they don't allow you to play to the middle of the floor, so like an aggressive switch would probably give it the most. Second would be um, someone packing it at the free throw line, off the ball, giving help, and that's to me um, things you can do. You, I mean, the biggest thing is. You pass through single gaps, drive through double and triple gaps. So if you're creating those double and triple gaps, that pack line isn't really there. You're starting to distort their defensive spacing, if you will. Um, switching, what causes that is a skill development thing. Have you taught what a positive pass is versus a negative pass? If you're throwing a lot of negative passes, it makes it really easy to switch. Is your player getting pushed outside? And not getting north south so you get that weaving action that people go how do i get rid of the weave well you got to attack north south so that's skill development stuff like playing off the catch split steps getting getting straight downhill um kind of feeling the game out one play ahead of the time so you you're, you really got to as you're catching it see the defense feel the defense be ready and go okay is this a shot and we, we use these words. You either move it, shoot it, or drive it, move it, or shoot it. And it depends on the order. Uh, I mean, certain certain players, it might be shoot it, number one, for them. Depending on who you play. Another player might be a move it kit. And another one might be a drive it kit. Um, but it's skill development, to be quite honest, what really drives it. What What is it for you guys that I know... I know John runs it. What one gives you the most problems? Um, you know, I, I, I think really you started to talk about um, kind of crowding it in there, kind of taking away those gaps. Um, you know, something I, I've found, Coach, too, is the quick passing really helps. Because, mm -hmm. um, we, you know, um, any time where the other team has those short closeouts, I think that hurts us. Um, so I think anytime I can, and I've heard you say it, coach, the small advantage into big advantage. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that is really important. I think it's when it's so many small advantages over and over and your team just starts settling for threes and doesn't attack the basket anymore. That's when I start to get a little irritated. So, <laughs> yeah. When you said pack it in, remember how I said skill, why are they packing it in? Probably because your team can't shoot. Yes, and I, I think some teams around here, though, also are just going to – yeah, they're going to dare you to shoot. Um, right. Even if, you know, even if our team can shoot a little bit, they rather we shoot it and hope we miss than, uh, than get the layups. 
Yeah, I think with 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 me, it, it comes down to, to spacing. A, a lot of times I see the biggest problem is as you get in your flow, right? You start out great spacing, you get get your spots. And then as you get into it, that spacing shrinks and shrinks and shrinks more towards more towards the uh, three point line to where you don't have a chance to use those skill development things. And if, and if you do, you're running into, you know, two players trying to make a tough pass, um, not, not attacking that paint and that kind of, kind of bogs it down. So, so that's, that's kind of how I, I look at it. Like you can't, you can't use your skill if you don't have the space to put it, to put it in action. Gotcha. Uh, so, okay. You, you talk, talked about, we talked about opponents. So let's, let's go to you. You have a game, say you play next game and like the first half, you're like, man, we're just really having trouble here. We can't get it going offensively. Um, at halftime, you're making adjustments. What are maybe a key, you talked about your, your layup percentages and things like that, but what are you, what are you looking at to say, okay, why aren't we being as successful right now? What are some of the things you're looking at within your offense, you know, to say, why aren't we being successful? Maybe not just numbers, but things you're doing, concepts, things like that. I'm kind of observing in a game. It's hard to do in high school, um, but after games, we would chart paint touches. But so we're, we're trying to figure out, are we getting in the paint? Are they, are we being a drop zone team or are we getting to the basket type team? If we're just picking it up at the drop zone, it's, we're not, they're either leveling us off, making us play East West. We're not getting our shoulders turned. So we start talking about things that help us get to the basket. Um, We may talk about, Hey, we need to use these actions more. If we've been doing a lot of just nail cuts, loop shortcuts, we may change it to doing longer cuts based upon how they're playing defense to open up the gaps. And it, it basically still boils down to Vance's old original top three, attack, creating gaps, and your spacing. Um, I, I can always lead it back to those things if we're struggling. Is our spacing good? Are we creating gaps? Now, if it's a, hey, they're physically better than us, then we're maybe going to have to go to more of some screening actions to free up some players. And that's how I would go from there. It might be, hey, we're not able to beat this team off the dribble. And it's going to happen sometimes. You're going to be, they're going to be more skilled or, or more physically stronger or whatever against you. So you got to have a change up, if you will, or a curveball to throw with it. So what are some of those uh, things you like to do, those, those concepts that, that you really like? And I, we can expand this even, even more, maybe some things you're seeing now that, that you really like and you're, you're interested in, because obviously you watch a lot of basketball. You have a lot of, a lot of great content out there. I know I see you, you're seeing you putting stuff out all the time from different teams. So what are the concepts you like? And then maybe some things you're, you're interested in here that you've seen. Well, I flow. I mean, I did a, I did a thing with uh, John Wheeler, um, and we dubbed it Princeton drive motion where I blend a little bit of Princeton actions with it. So that gets you like a chin action. So say, Hey, I could talk about, you get, you start throwing in some back screens there. And then bottom line is once the ball hits the deck, you're into dribble drive concepts. Um, you might run point series if you have a great ball screen player and in high school, I don't, I'm not a big ball screen guy because I don't think I have enough players that can make those reads to be honest, or I'm either that, or I'm terrible at teaching it. One, one of the two. And, but I usually think I have one player that's pretty good at it. So we'll run like the point series for that player to get the ball back in a live dribble situation. Now they're using the ball screen. So I think the teams that just dribble, dribble, dribble up, send one player through and they do a middle ball screen. Everybody knows that's coming and they're going to blitz it, double it, get the ball out of your best player's hands, blow you up, and now your advantage is gone. Where if you have him pass it, create a little bit of false movement, get it back, now he can drive it. He has a live dribble. He can fake it and go one way, or he could use it. So that's why I like to use some of the Princeton actions with with dribble drive. This is not not concept related, but I I just kind of popped in my head. Um, How, you know, 
what are your thoughts on a number of reversals from from side to side whether it be drive and get it to the other side um you know how, how many do you think not not i guess on a number but um how can teams use those reversals and moving the ball side to side and getting move move the defense to be to be effective i i know those stats are out there um but i i look at shooting percentages in like the first first half of the shot clock again i'm in a shot clock thing so um, we're looking to get, I'm looking to get a quick shot. I want to score in the first 12 seconds. So I'm not a big ball reversal guy. Um, as long as there's a caveat, the best players are shooting the basketball in the first 12 seconds. If it's my fifth best scorer and we're clanking it and clanking it, um, there's going to be a conversation and we have a call. So when we're struggling, we call streak and a streak call is, a nonverbal timeout means we got to run our offense until our best players touch the basketball. So in that aspect, I mean, a good, most people will say you got first side's low percentage, second side is this. If you get in the dribble drive, if you get a kick up to a kick up to another kick up, you're probably going to get a very good shot. There is a week that is honestly a weakness for a lot of teams is shot discipline because you get shots quick. So when you're up six points with two minutes to go and you have a 35 second shot clock and your kids are still shooting it with 23 on the shot clock, my hair gets a little grayer um, because <laughs> we, we, we got to understand, okay, yeah, that you're open, but we need to use shot clock. So yeah. that being said, we always look at, okay, that was okay, but could we have gotten a better one? So we always talk about one more pass. Is that go from good to great? We want great shots. We don't want just good shots. And like John and you have said, great is defined by the coach. Your number one and two players could take a good shot, which in your mind is a great shot over your other player shooting just a good shot. So that's still teaching coaching no matter what you run teaching your players what is a good shot for them not necessarily what everybody in the gym will think is a good shot <laughs> okay. yeah, and i think i think for you the shot clock makes a big difference like here in Illinois, we don't have make this have a shot clock so yeah. you know like you kind of have to at times if you can get a good shot great shot early that's that's going to be something to take whereas a lot of times here we can work for uh, yeah. uh, a greater shot, I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And about the first 12 seconds, the shooting percentage is the highest than the yep. middle section. Yep. And the last 12 seconds in the shot clock for, for us, if you were or last 11. So, so 10 or less, we'll say we're probably shooting under 30%. No, I agree. I think that's why most people focus on transition offense. Cause that's probably when you're getting the highest percentage shot. Um, so we want to move into our last two segments. The first one we call 30 second timeout. We do it with all of our guests. It's your platform to talk about anything you want. It could be about yourself, your own podcast, your family, your program, um, something you want our listeners to know about. Basically 30 seconds, any topic you want to talk about, the floor is yours. I just want to let people know about uh, dribble drive motion. Um, me and Kurt Gelsdorf have a Facebook community. If anybody's on Facebook, uh, search Dribble Drive Motion Hoop Talk. There's over 2,600 coaches in there from the youth level to Division One coaches to some professional coaches that there's questions asked in there. There's people showing video, myself, others discussing it daily. So if you're interested in the Dribble Drive Motion offense, it's a great little community of coaches that share information daily about the offense. Awesome. I'll definitely have to I just join. Get on there. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely are you on, on that one, John? I think you are. I am on. Yes. I lose track of all the things I I, I gotta. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm 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 a I'm a I'm a member of quite a few groups. So. <laughs> uh, our last ones just quick hitters. We're gonna, gonna rapid fire okay. questions. Could be basketball. Could be not. First one. Uh, the the best, I guess, transition fast break team in, in the NBA today, or it could even be college. 
uh, well, whatever the best, whatever your choice, kind of your your choice here. NBA. Uh, hmm. Uh, don't. I mean, I watch the NBA. You guys see content that I put about it, but I don't really study it. I mean, fast break offenses. I'll go college. Um, if you're interested in system bath system type play, University of Pacific in Oregon runs a ball screen system. Uh, you got Greenville, uh, Nova Southeastern Division Two school. Um, on the D1 side, um, I'm a big Nate Oates fan. Alabama, they get up and down and yep. and get after it. Um, those those would be my my ones for for college. I'm, NBA, it's hard to I – mean, no one really no one really transition breaks too much. Yeah, and it's, it's probably dependent on individual players too that can yeah. really push and, and things like that. All right, so I'm going to – we're going to – I want it from you, your favorite pressure defensive team of all time. It can be college, pro, high school, I don't care. Your favorite team to watch just play pressure defense. Um, full court? Full court. Dude, that that makes like ten. That makes it like one percent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite team to watch full court uh, probably had to have been Loyola Marymount. Okay. Um. So let's go a little two pronged here. Uh, you kind of mentioned some of them, but best coaches to to kind of get info and, and obviously you are a great resource about the system, and then maybe a couple for dribble drive if people are looking to kind of really get into the the nuts and bolts and really study it um on the system gary smith doug porter uh george barber uh lauren glenn out of olivet on the girl side if you're doug and mm -hmm. doug and yep. lauren on the girl side on the on the men's side boys side um not well known i mean i if you, if you know system basketball and the stuff i put out matt peterson at university uh at pacific university in oregon a D3 school. He worked under Doug Porter and he also was at uh, Rhodes. So he's been at three different schools and ran the system at three different colleges as an assistant coach. Uh, very knowledgeable guy. Um, if you're interested in a ball screen style and a Wahlberg hybrid pressing where it has Wahlberg and system presses in it, um, Pacific with Justin Lunt and Matt Peterson. Justin Lunt's the head coach and Matt Peterson's the assistant coach. You know, it's kind of cool, Todd. I don't even know if you know all those. Pretty much every guy he said has some affiliation with Illinois, whether it's Matt yeah, Peterson, no, no or doubt. Porter coached around here for a long time. Yeah, Matt's from Illinois. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So, off of basketball, favorite place you've ever taken a vacation? Uh, Niagara Falls. Oh, I, I figured you were going to go some beach area. Why Niagara okay. Falls? I'm just curious. Uh, Canada, um, it's where one of the first vacations I went with my wife. Um, she's from, she's from Canada. She took me to Niagara Falls. It was a, it was, we were spring break from school, not, not my school time, but during school time. And it was, it was stinking snowing during spring break. And the joke, the joke was the California guys trying to scrape the snow off the window in, in, <laughs> in, in Niagara Falls. And on the Canadian side, there's Niagara Falls, and then on the other side, on the U.S. side, um, you got to see you got to see it on the on the Canadian side. So that's that's that was my favorite spot so far. That's pr that's probably entertaining oh. enough for the locals seeing the California guy deal with the snow, right? Oh, she was laughing up in the hotel room. <laughs> uh, a common coaching thought that you don't agree with. You have to have athletes to press. Hmm. That's interesting. I just want to, I just want to delve into that a little bit. What do you mean there? I, I know what the, the adage is. So kind of take us through our, to our listeners. Let's say they think they don't have athletes. How would you help them realize you can still press? Um, the only thing I can tell people is I did it at a school where I had one player in eight years go on to play college basketball and we were very successful uh, it was known for soccer um, and just had a bunch of hard-working kids and it is not reliant on athleticism defense in my mind 
is reliant on heart and effort and desire. Um, I don't think you have to be athletic. If, you, if you're smarter than your opponent, you can take angles and make up for your speed. And I just think it's just a want-to thing. It's not a, it's not, um, I think it's harder to teach people how to score and how to be skilled basketball player. But if everything was athleticism and desire, then I love Shaq. He was in, he was a Laker. He was out here. But if it was all about that, then how can tell me how he did not lead the league in rebounding and Charles Barkley at six foot four did. True. And Dennis Rodman. Um, <laughs> now, now are those guys athletic? Yes. Yeah. So, um, but I think the adage of you have to be this or that to run certain styles of basketball is, is, is baloney. That, I mean, it helps, but you get what you emphasize. If, if you, if you believe in it and you can sell it, your kids will believe in it and they'll do it. That's, that's my, my adage of you have to have athletes to press. So before we close it out, I just want to give you the opportunity uh, to kind of tell everyone where we can, where we can find you, maybe some stuff you have coming up, um, all those good things. Uh, systembasketball.com is my, my website with all the clinics I've hosted. Those are available if anybody's interested in that. Um, and social media, Coach Mark Hart, um, M-A-R-C-H-A-R-T. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, uh, YouTube channel. Lots of great resources on that. If you're not on there, you can search under System Basketball. Um, upcoming events. Um, I do have something tonight. Uh, people won't hear it. Um, it's attacking odd front zone defenses for people that are in my membership club. So I do have a membership club for people to join that has a bunch of clinics on it, like a Netflix type thing for people. So awesome, awesome. Well, for all of our listeners, uh, Coach Hart's a tremendous, tremendous follow. You can you can learn a lot from him um, and and his his guests. Um, so I encourage all of you to, to check all those, all those things out. Um, you know, coach, I know we're always kind of, we're looking at your stuff and, and trying to apply it to what we're doing. And, you know, cause Appreciate I think it. that's, what's coaching about, right. Melding, yeah. melding everything into kind of what you believe. So we can't, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. I had a great time. It's always, it's always fun to be on the other side of the mic, getting the questions. So um, appreciate what you guys do. Keep up the, Keep up the great work. Love listening to your guys' podcast as well. Thank you for listening to another episode of the After the Timeout podcast, hosted by Todd Zazadil and John Plicky. For more show content and upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at After the Timeout or subscribe to our podcast for upcoming episodes. For show inquiries, you can email us at afterthetimeout at gmail.com. You can find all of our previous episodes on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts by searching After the Timeout. We appreciate you listening. Tune in next time for more coaching content in-game, out-of-the-game, and anything in between.